this is Brian from ClassicRockHistory.com, and today I have with me a true rock and roll legend, a man who, for anybody who's been listening to rock and roll music for the past 35 to 40 years, this man needs no introduction. Warren Haynes, how you doing, buddy? Good, man. How are you doing? All right. It's so good to have you here today. You have this incredibly great new album uh, that was just released, and uh, I want to talk about that. Um, but first, I just kind of want to touch on a few things, just so the younger audience, you know, gets to know you a little bit. Um, now, I think we're probably around the same age, you know, give or take a few years, need a direction. But I'm going to assume that growing up, you know, you probably were listening to the Allman Brothers band when you were younger. Uh, I first heard the Allman Brothers when I was nine years old. Uh, my oldest brother had uh, the first album when it came out. And uh, I had not yet picked up guitar at that point, but I had already started singing. I was uh, emulating all my favorite soul singers in my bedroom, listening to Sam and Dave and the Four Tops and the Temptations and Otis Redding and James Brown. And when my oldest brother started listening to rock music, at first it was Hendrix and Cream. Uh, and then, I guess in 1969, uh, he got a copy of the first Allman Brothers record. And I really loved it even then. Uh, I had not been bitten by the guitar bug yet, but I loved Greg's voice. And I just loved the overall sound of it. Then about two years later, I started playing guitar, which was coincidentally around the time that Live at Fillmore East came out. Wow. So, you know, that really makes a lot of sense when you think about it, because you're like you're saying, you're listening to all these soul singers, probably this, this like the ones you mentioned, the Stax records. And Greg Allman just had that voice, you know, I mean, he was rock and roll, but he had that such a soulful voice there. Yeah, which... absolutely. And I, I think that was the first thing that drew me into that music. So now in the next decade, in the 80s, you're you're playing with Dickie Betts. You're in his band. And I remember uh, picking up the cassette pattern disruptive and going like, holy smokes, this is like a rocking, a rocking album. Now you're in his band and you grew up now, you listening to the Allman Brothers band. Now as a musician, everybody always has to have a lot of confidence when you're playing on stage, when you're playing in the studio. But how did you balance that out playing with someone like that now, as opposed to saying, well, you know, Dickie Betts is right across the room from me. Dickie Betts is right next stage. Huh. Well, you know, thankfully it was a gradual process. You know, I, I first met Dickie in 1981. I was 21. And uh, he and Greg Allman uh, came by the studio that I was working in at that time. And they were both extremely complimentary and, and uh, supportive. Uh, Dickie and I hung out and played guitar some that night. And we just kind of uh, started a friendship. Then, you know, I would see him a year or two later, and he invited me up on stage to sit in with his band. This was at a time when the Allman Brothers were broken up. Yeah. Um, and then a few years after that, Marty Prevett, who was the bass player in Dickie's band at the time, had been telling uh, Dickie that we should get me uh, in the band. And uh, so coincidentally, Dickie was working on this album that never came out and I got hired to sing background on the album. And so I walked in the studio and Dickie was like, hey, man, what are you, what are you doing here? And I was like, uh, uh, I got hired to sing on your record. And he's like, oh, wow. He, he said, <laughs> you got a guitar? And I'm like, no, I just came to sing. And we were laughing and it kind of planted a seed. And about three weeks later, he called me up and said, uh, hey, man, I just want to let you know that I scrapped that record we were working on. He said it just wasn't me. Uh, why don't we get together, write some rock and roll songs and, and make a rock and roll record? And so that turned into Pattern Disrupted. And, and what a great album that was. I mean, that's the first time that I didn't know who you were at the time. And, and I remember picking up the cassette and there was like no liner notes in the, in the cassette. All there was was a picture. And, and if there uh, were, you couldn't read them anyway. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's right. were notorious for like yeah. tiny, tiny print, you know. 
That's right, man. It was always hard to read those liner notes. But any, you know, there are there are fans, there are rock and roll fans that always want to know who's in the band, you know. And then it kind of started to make sense later on when when I discovered that you were in that group. So now all of a sudden, maybe what two years later, nineteen ninety, you're you find yourself in the reformed Allman Brothers band. And what what brought that band back together? How were you a part of that? Well. Uh... I had written a bunch of songs with Dickie for the Pattern Disruptive record and and Epic uh, signed Dickie to to Epic Records and Greg was on Epic Records and I had written the title track to Greg's most recent solo record at that time just before the bullets fly. So I was I had found myself in this weird position of being kind of part of both of those camps. And uh, even though they never talked about reforming in January of 89, I got a call saying we're reforming the Allman Brothers and we want you to join. And so it was a, a shock to me because every time it ever got brought up prior to that, the answer was always, no, that's never going to happen. So then it did happen. And they, they said, we want you to come in, not just as a, guitar player and slide guitar player, but also as a, a singer and a songwriter. And I was like, fantastic. I can't imagine a, a, a more gracious opportunity. You know, one of my favorite bands of all times. But I thought it was just going to be for one year to do a, a reunion tour. And I think it could have been that had it not been so successful and had the band not been, uh, A, getting along very well. The original members were, were getting along for a change. And B, the music just sounded fantastic. The chemistry of the, the old man with the new players was amazing. And so, hey, let's do it next year. Let's do it the year after. And 25 years later, you know, it was still going on. I mean, when you, when you joined and you accepted that offer, did you feel a lot of pressure? I mean, being part of the Allman Brothers band? It's a pretty leg well, legendary band. I did, but not as much as I would have felt if it just happened overnight, because I had had at that point, two and a half years of being in Dickie's band, right. Writing with him, standing on stage next to him every night, uh, honing in our guitar tandem. And that made it much easier than let's say Alan Woody who auditioned. And then the next day was in the Allman brothers. Uh, you know, I had what I consider an, an initiation period. So, I mean, I, you know, I guess friendship really matters. I mean, knowing each other well is, is important in a band like that. Yeah, having a relationship uh, really means everything. And of course, I had studied that music intently all my life. But once I started playing with Dickie, all these unanswered questions uh, became answered. From a musical standpoint, I started learning from the inside what made that music tick. And, uh, and of course, when you're playing it with the people that made it originally and, and wrote it originally, it's a whole nother layer of, uh, uh, of understanding that, that go, you know, a lot of those songs I had played in club bands and bar bands and garage bands. But when I started playing them with the Allman Brothers, it was like, wow, this is a whole nother level of playing this music uh, in, in a way that only that band could, you know. Sure. So you had, you. I guess you found yourself feeding off of everybody and, and, and doing things maybe you didn't even expect to be doing. I mean, that's what happens sometimes with musicians. I mean, yeah, no question. You know, and everybody in that band had such a strong musical personality and a, a strong actual personality that, uh, that's really what makes it work uh, is all these strong personalities coming together and working in a way that might be great or might not. Uh, you know, when you, a chemistry like that, you never know until you actually experience it. And, and being on the inside of that was, was just fantastic. You know, the way that band communicated on stage, uh, was amazing but they they kind of created their own language their own style of music and of course i was a huge fan so being part of it all of a sudden was was fantastic yeah i think i think part of what fuels all of that is you know it seemed like everybody was listening to each other 
as as opposed to a band with so much talent where no one's really paying attention, you guys always seem to be listening intently to what everybody was doing. Well, that's taking a jazz approach uh, <laughs> to music, okay, and which is what which is what that band did. You know, uh, in some music, everybody just plays their part and doesn't deviate from it, and it works. And you just rehearse and get everything right, and then you play it the same way night after night. The Allman Brothers music was never about that. It was always about listening to each other intently on stage and responding in a, a jazz manner to what you were hearing. And so we were paying more attention to ourselves than we were to the audience when we were on stage. But the audience felt, I think, an even bigger part of that because they could feel that it was momentary. What was going on was was in the moment and being created in a spontaneous way. And so I think in some ways, feeling part of that is more important than feeling part of uh, just listening, uh, if, if you, you get the distinction. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I, the audience was in tune to that. I mean, you know, you have all different types of people in a, in a rock and roll audience. You have musicians and you have people who aren't musicians. And so some people will be coming more in tune, I guess, to what you're doing than others. But it was definitely noticeable, and it was very interesting to watch it happen over the years as the lineup changed a little bit. But based, you know, because we're we're here to talk about your your new solo album, and it's in those early years that you are with the Allman Brothers where you release your first solo album, which I believe was in 1993, "Tales of Ordinary Madness." If I have yes. that right. So, what fuels that? What fuels that desire to? release a solo album while you're in the Allman Brothers band. I mean, was it tough to well, do that? I had been uh, working toward releasing my first solo record before I got the call from Dickie Betts to join his band. Uh, I had just started embarking on my first record contract and, and uh, starting my career as a, as a solo artist. I was, uh, I think I was 26 at the time. Then I got a call from Dickie saying, hey, I want you to join my band and let's write a bunch of music. And so I postponed making a solo record to do that. And then two years later, I was like, OK, now it's time for me to make a, a solo record. And I got a call saying they wanted me to join the Allman Brothers. So once again, for the, the world's best reason, I said, OK, well, I guess I have to post my, postpone my solo record a little bit more. Uh, the interesting thing about that was, even though I pushed that record back for about five years, I was inheriting this new audience by being part of the Allman Brothers. Now, all of a sudden, all those fans wanted to know what it was I had to say, which gave me more of a reason to uh, kind of explore certain influences uh, and accentuate certain influences more than others based on this inherited audience, so to speak. Um, so uh, I recorded Tales of Ordinary Madness in 92, and it came out in 93. Um, and again, not knowing if the Allman Brothers were going to keep going, because their history it was always three years. They would stay together three years yeah. and then break up. Yeah, so I don't think... somewhere around 92, we were overdue for a breakup, but it just never came. No, it didn't. You just guys kept putting out great albums. I mean, the, the stuff that you put out in the 90s, Shades of Two Worlds, Where It All Began, those are phenomenal records. I mean, yeah, starting with Seven Turns, which was the first one that I did, uh, which we recorded in 90, uh, Song for Song, a really great record. And it was the first Allman Brothers record in a really, really long time that sounded like the original band. They had kind of through the years uh, been chasing the music scene a little bit and wound up in a place that none of them were comfortable with. And so when we reformed in 89, the mission was, let's get back to 69, 70, 71. And if we can do that, the sky's the limit. Yeah, I think that's what you guys, you, what you guys definitely did. So now you have the Allman Brothers Band, you have your solo album, and there you go and you form a new band called Government Mule. What fueled the desire to do that? Well, that came about uh, as a result of 
a conversation on the tour bus uh, between myself and Alan Woody. Uh, Alan Woody and myself and Greg Allman shared a, a bus. And so our bus spent a lot of time uh, listening to music and, and laughing and telling stories and jokes. And it was a what we referred to as the fun bus. Um, so one day we're listening to Hendrix or Cream <clears throat> or something like that. And Alan Woody just commented, you know, nobody does that anymore. The whole improvisational, what they call a power trio, uh, bass, drums, and guitar, exploratory kind of trio. He said, you know, me and you and the right drummer could could pull that off. And I instantly thought of Matt Apps, who I had played with in Dickie's band. And so we decided to schedule a jam session just to see what happened. Matt was living in LA and uh, the Allen Brothers were gonna be in LA. We had a night off and Matt was playing at some little club and he invited us to come out. And we jammed together for the first time. And it was, it was uncanny, especially the way he and Alan Woody played together. It just had this magical thing that that those power trios had. So that turned into, hey, why don't we make a low budget experimental record for a, a side project and then do a little tour and promote it and then go back to our day jobs. Uh, but things changed. Government Mule kind of sprouted wings and became its own thing. And it, at the same time, the Allman Brothers, uh, the original members were not getting along. There was no songwriting, no rehearsing, no recording. And so all those things were happening in the government mule camp. So it kind of eventually led to us veering off and, and starting our own thing. So did you think that was it with the Allman Brothers band? Did you expect to get back together with them again? Because you do go back to them later on. I I had no intentions of, of going back. Government mule had become my priority at that point. And we were really clicking and everything was uh, was just uh, kind of falling into place. And then Alan Woody passed away in 2000, which was a total shock to everyone. Uh, had it not been for that, I don't think I would have considered going back to the Allman Brothers. But after Woody passed, the future of Government Mule was up in the air, to say the least. And one of the first calls I got was from Greg Allman, who was really close to Woody. And uh, he said, hey, man, I, I sure love to have you back in the Allman Brothers. And I was like, well, maybe we'll give that a go and see see what happens. So they scheduled the Beacon Theater uh, in New York uh, as the Allman Brothers with special guest Warren Haynes. So if it didn't work out, it wouldn't look like I had rejoined <laughs> and quit again. You had an out, uh, they said. <laughs> but it worked. Uh, it, you know, the, everybody was getting along. The music sounded great. And Government Mule was kind of uh, up in the air at that point. And I just thought, you know, I'll, I'll give it a shot. It, and, of course, that led to 14 years, which is the longest any incarnation of the Allman Brothers has ever been together. And. And that was a really special 14 years because, you know, watching you and Derek Trucks playing together on stage, I, I saw you so many times and that was just magical. Those years were magical, the two of you guys playing together. And the chemistry of that band was was very special. Yeah. Um, and of course, the longer we did it, the better it got. Uh, it was it was a wonderful experience. Um and the fact that that band could exist on that high level all those years down the the road, it really speaks mostly to what the original band created, the original six piece band with Dwayne Allman and, and Barry Oakley um, created something so magical and so timeless that we were always keeping in, in the forefront of our minds that honoring that. Yeah, and, and and taking that philosophy on stage with us every night, and I think that's why it worked. Yeah, I mean, you could hear it that you were channeling that, but you were also bringing this modern sound to it, and I think you know also developing a new audience. I think you found just so many more fans, so many more younger fans, 
you know, you guys played a lot of festivals where there were a lot of young fans there. And, and um, just, I mean, listening to you and Derek play together, it was almost like listening to one person sometimes. And if you close your eyes, sometimes it was hard to distinguish who was playing. Or at least yeah, for me it was. You know, I, I think the key to uh, having that guitar, that two guitar relationship is knowing each other's vocabulary to the extent that you can kind of finish each other's thoughts sometimes. And and he and I were actually acknowledging that recently because uh, he's on three songs on my new solo record. And there's one song uh, called These Changes that we're kind of trading off in traditional Allman Brothers sort of style. Uh, and another one called Hall of Future Saints that we're taking a similar approach. And he made the comment, it sounds like we're finishing each other's ideas, which is really more uh, gratifying and more dimensional than like dueling it out. You know what I mean? There, there's something about that. And again, that's a jazz approach. That's more like a Coltrane Miles sort of thing. Yeah, it never felt like, you know, it never felt like it was a duel. It always felt like you were just so complimenting each other. And so let's talk about this new record. Uh, called Million Voices Whisper. Um, I love the title, and I'd love to know, you know, what's the meaning behind that? What are you thinking with that title? Uh, the title came from the chorus of the song Day of Reckoning. Uh, the chorus says, million voices whisper, getting louder when we sing, million spirits waiting on a day of reckoning. And I liked million voices whisper as, as a title it just kind of seemed up seemed to sum up the spirit of, of the record a, a, a bit you know um and uh that song day of reckoning i wrote with uh lucas nelson and he and jamie johnson are singing with me on that song and lucas is also playing some beautiful guitar on that song as well that is a great song i've been listening to the album now for the past week since it came out on digital and I see now it's, I see it's on Amazon. I see the records out. Um, so the album opens up with the song you were just talking about, these changes. And, and I'm listening to that song and I'm thinking, well, I hear the lyrics, these changes you're talking about. I think you're talking about people going through changes, but also the, the title, these changes, when you listen to the core changes in that song, I mean, is there a double meaning there that you're implying with that title? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, it's more about the lyrical side of it. Uh, and it's it's written about a personal relationship and how challenging it can be uh, to try to keep it together year after year, decade after decade. And the whole world is going through this. So it's kind of universal in the way that I think since the whole COVID lockdown thing a few years ago, this has been the only time in my lifetime where the entire world has experienced the same challenges. Yeah. And it's all about how we interpret them and how we react to them and how we respond and come out on the other side. And, and if something's important enough, uh, you make it happen, you know, and, uh, Derek and I wrote that tune together. We wrote the music together and, and, and I wrote uh, the lyric. Um, that jam at the end where we kind of went into this Allman Brothers-esque sort of uh, journey. It's so good. <laughs> that, that just happened in the studio. That wasn't part of the writing process. Yeah. Uh, we got into the studio and just looked at each other and said, should we open it up at the end and see what happens? And I'm like, yeah, let's do. And and that was a result of, of what happened. Yeah, so much of the spirit. I mean, that's a song that kind of brings you to tears. I mean, I got emotional listening to that song because there's so much going on. And especially that ending, that ending, it's kind of bringing back the spirit of what you guys did together night after night on stage. And anybody who experienced that, to listen to you doing it again on your solo album, it's just phenomenal to hear. Well, that's kind of uh what we were hoping to achieve you know is to capture what we do on stage and so a, a lot of uh artists a lot of bands would have decided to kind of curtail the jam experience a little bit but i figure if if we're gonna 
get the two of us in the same studio for the first time in ages. That's what I want to hear. That's what he wants to hear. That's what most of our audience wants to hear. Let's just uh, let it roll and see what happens, you know. And the bridge, man, the the chord changes that you guys play in that bridge. Is that something that both of you wrote at the same time? Or did one of you say, hey, I got this bridge? Or how did that come together? Uh, we were down at his place. He has a farm outside of Macon, Georgia. And I went down there. We spent three days together just hanging out and writing music. And it was all a, a just a natural, organic process. You know, he, he had that uh, original lick that starts the song. Bah, bah, bah. Yeah. He, he had that little riff and I started responding to it. And then we eventually kind of came up with all the changes together. Uh, and we tweaked it for two or three days. And then by the time we got into the studio, uh, it, it had still changed a little bit. And then once we started rolling tape, it changed even more. So, you know, songs go through, no pun intended, a lot of changes yeah. by the time people hear them. Of course, them. yeah. Um, well, it's it sounds like a new classic. I mean, it's just such a great tune. And I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if we're going on and on about this song because there's so many other great songs on the record. I mean, right after that opening song, you go to Go Down Swinging. And I love how, I mean, I always thought that the second song on an album is really important. Uh, and you change the groove on that right away. And it almost has that Stax sound to it, that, that soulful 60s sound to it. Was that on purpose? Yeah. Yeah. I kind of felt like, um, well, I thought these changes was the best opener. Every time I messed with the sequence, I always wound up with that. So song number two, what's that going to be? Yeah. Go down swinging just felt like it made a sharp turn into another place, but it still had the same spirit, it had the horn section, had the soul music influence. Uh, that one, I, it kind of reminds me of like, B.B. King and Van Morrison playing together or something, you know, yeah. uh, and it just seemed like a nice uh, one two punch to to start the record. You know, now I, I, I know everybody loves your ballad Soul Shine, but there's a new ballad on this on this record um, uh, till the sun comes shining through, I believe. That's just beautiful. That reminds me of, you know, has the feel of Soul Shine, uh, I think. How did, where did that song come from, So the Sun Comes Shining Through? I wrote that song uh, a few years ago with my friend, Red Akins, who is a, a a big Nashville songwriter, one of the top songwriters in, in Nashville. And he and I have been friends for decades. Um, and we've written several songs together, but mostly for other artists. And so one day we were hanging out writing together and he said, hey, man, let's write something for you. Let's write something you would record. And I was like, all right, cool. Let's do that. <laughs> and a few hours later, we had written till the sun comes shining through. We actually made a nice little demo of it that captured the song really well. And I always wanted to record it. But once we got into the studio, I thought, I think I need to take it a little bit further. So we added that whole slide guitar solo at the end that really long slide solo that that kind of takes it to fourth gear um that was not the plan uh, kind of similar to what we were talking about with these changes until we got into the studio rolling tape that that had never uh come up before but it was a way of making that song uh not just a song but also uh, an emotional kind of centerpiece of the record it's amazing how, as a songwriter, songs will just take you somewhere. Sometimes you don't expect them to take you. It's like they they form their own life. Something like that happens. Something magical can happen. Yeah, and that's one of the beautiful things about, A, working in the studio, uh, and, and B, working with, with great musicians, is that those sort of things can just happen spontaneously, and a song can go to a whole other level uh that up until that moment had never been considered you know and that's one of the things i love about making records i'm always open to what might happen you know i, I never want to go into the studio closed-minded about it's got to be this way or it's got to be that way you know because a lot of the best moments happen spontaneously 
like on stage, right? I mean, you just sometimes things hit you on stage, a moment happens, and you know, it's 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 something that you know, you don't know where it comes from sometimes, I guess. And that that's the best part, I think. <laughs> uh yeah. you know, those moments are the are the, the my favorite moments, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh and you never know who might initiate the uh, the spark, you know. Somebody, uh, one of the musicians might play something that triggers somebody else to do something. And then the next thing you know, you're traveling down a new path that didn't exist. And that's one of the many things I love about music. All right. I know, I know you got to go. You probably have a pretty big schedule. I don't want to keep you too long. Um, I'll just ask you. So we're coming to an end of 2024. What do you got planned for 2025? Well, a lot. Uh, we're going to continue promoting Million Voices Whisper. Uh, I also am releasing uh, a live two CD set with uh, the Asheville Symphony Orchestra that was recorded with uh, O'Teal Burbridge on bass, John Medeski on keyboards, um, Jeff Sipe on drums, and Greg Osby on saxophone that was recorded right before COVID, but we delayed it because it's like a once in a lifetime retrospective record and we didn't want to get it, we didn't want it to get lost in the shuffle. So we're going to put that record out next year and do some some more shows with the symphony. Um, also next year is Government Mule's 30th anniversary of the, the first album. So we have some special Mule shows lined up and and also some archival releases uh, some music that nobody's heard before with uh, the original trio with Alan Woody. And uh, I'm excited for people to hear that stuff as well. Yeah. Can you believe it's been 30 years since you formed that band? Absolutely not. It, you know, I, all that, those early days are still embedded in my brain as if it were yesterday, but yeah, in some ways it, there's 30 years of wear and tear, Yeah, but uh, yeah, a lot of mileage, right? <laughs> yeah, a lot of miles, but also, uh, you know, a lot of beautiful memories that seem like yesterday. So, you know, that's that's the way those things work. And I'm amazed that it's 30 years. I'm amazed that it lasted 30 years because we were just going to make one record. We never even thought we would make a second record. And I think our last record was our 12th or 13th uh, studio record. So, you know, careful what you wish for, I guess. Well, you know, you've given this world so much beautiful music, you know, so many great moments. And uh, I have to thank you on behalf of all, you know, rock and roll fans. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you for doing what you've been doing, you know, uh, making this world a better place with your beautiful music, man, and inspiring. Yeah. You. Uh, you know, I'm forever grateful for the, the opportunity. I, I, to be able to do what I love for a living and to be able to do it the way I love to do it. it you know, that's that's the most you can hope for. Yeah, man. Well, keep doing it, you know, because we're going to keep listening. And, and, you know, thanks so much for, you know, taking the time to talk with us. On The new album is great. And I hope everybody that watches this interview goes and, and picks it up because it's a fantastic record. You have two editions out, right? You have the, the standard and then you have a deluxe edition. I saw it too, with like three extra tracks. Yeah. Three or four. The deluxe extra. edition has, has four... Uh, four extra tracks and uh one i wrote with uh with booker t which uh, is beautiful and there's also a uh, myself and jamie johnson and lucas nelson doing an acapella version of find the cost of freedom the crosby seals nash song that uh segues into an extended version of day of reckoning uh which is included on the, the bonus cd as well you know, our fans love excess, as do I. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I think we sell more of the the uh, deluxe editions than we do of the standard editions, which is great by me. It's almost like saying we put a, put out a double record every time. Yeah. But we also put the, the normal one out for those people that aren't quite as into excess. Sure. Well, I mean, listen, you know, go back to the beginning of the Allman Brothers band. There was a lot of big box sets that they put out and, you know, Fillmore East being a double record set and the Eater Peach oh, and all yeah. that stuff. You Absolutely. Know, so, yeah. And, uh, you know, you know, rock and roll fans will eat up everything they can get. They always want more. It's just Yeah. And, and 
I'm that kind of fan myself. So I, I think I'm uh, aware of that when we release music. When when I hear somebody put out a deluxe version that has all these other versions or different songs, I want to hear that. Yeah. So uh, we don't want to deprive our fans of that. Yeah. There's a big collector's audience. And you're feeling good now? You're feeling good to go out on the road and healthy? Yeah. It's been great. I've been feeling great and, and really enjoying being back on tour. Uh, just kind of glad to get things back to normal after all the craziness, you know? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, Warren, once again, thanks so much um, for talking with us. Where should people, where should people get the uh, the CD or the vinyl? Where should they go to get it? The well, uh, if you, if you have a favorite record store, okay. go to go there and get the vinyl or the CD. You can go to uh, warrenhaines.net for any unanswered questions. Okay. Uh, you know, and there's all the the normal Amazon type outlets, but uh, if if you're looking to discover the options, uh, go to warrenhaines.net and check it out. All right, I'll make sure I put a link to your site in the article. All right. Cool. cool. All right, yeah, Warren, man. man. It it was cool, man. I appreciate it. Good luck with everything. Just keep rocking, man. Keep rocking. Thank you, man. Good to see you. All right, Warren. Take care, buddy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>